This video was made in collaboration with the Avatar Wiki. If you'd like to learn more, check out the link in the description. The Life of Varric Iknik Blackstone Varric, more commonly known by his last name, is an eccentric and charismatic non-bending billionaire businessman known for his ambitious nature and flamboyance. Born in the Southern Water Tribe, he is a nobleman who enjoys gallivanting across the globe on his yacht and flaunting his extravagant lifestyle, often at the expense of his then assistant and later wife, Julie. A man who respects directness, he struck up a close friendship with the honest and candid earthbender Bolin. He later masterminded a civil war between the Northern and Southern Water Tribes, claiming that Unalak's occupation of his country was a threat to the South's wealth, especially his own, while furthering his true intention of profiting off the escalating conflict. However, his attempt to also draw the United Republic into the war led to his arrest. Nevertheless, Varric soon managed to escape and settled down in Zaufu as the head of the city's technology department, though he later accompanied Kuvira on her quest to reunite the Earth Kingdom. Unwilling to weaponize spirit energy for her, Varric eventually deserted her army in 174 AG and helped Team Avatar stop her from conquering Republic City. After Kuvira was defeated, Varric married Julie, and after she won the presidential election, he became the first gentleman of the United Republic. Welcome to the Amagi. In today's video, we're going over the life of Varric. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Early Life Varric was born to a poor seal hunter. Growing up on a farm, he once had a pet ostrich horse named Mrs. Beaks, whom he loved but took for granted. At some point, he was taken away by the circus. As he grew up in the Southern Water Tribe, he managed to expand his business from a single canoe into a global enterprise, until he finally controlled the entire global shipping business. A consummate dealmaker, he is always looking for opportunities to expand his business empire. Sometime after the anti-bending revolution, Varric helped sponsor Ryko and his opponent in their respective candidacies for President of the United Republic of Nations, with Ryko winning the election. Business Deal with Asami Sato In 171 AG, Varric met with Asami Sato during the Glacier Spirits Festival in order to discuss business arrangements to save her company, Future Industries, from bankruptcy. While in the middle of attempting to impress an audience with what he believed to be a levitation trick, Bolin and Asami entered his yacht, and Bolin noted that Varric was not levitating, to the shock of the people surrounding the billionaire, much to Asami's embarrassment. Though he seemed angry for a moment, Varric quickly became grateful that Bolin had pointed it out, and fired his swami for tricking him into believing he was levitating. He quickly took a liking to the young earthbender, and showed him a moving picture of an ostrich horse. He subsequently bought out the showgirl Ginger to strike poses, because he believed moving pictures to be old news. Asami tried getting Varric's attention to remind him of their business arrangement. Varric soon entered into a brief but tense stare-down with Asami before agreeing to finalize the details of their agreement. He took his guests on a rocket boat ride. Varric later attended the banquet held in honor of Chief Unalak of the Northern Water Tribe. After the chief gave his speech regarding his disappointment in the absence of spirituality in the South Pole, during which Varric was not paying attention because he was picking his teeth, he took the stage to cheer up the audience by calling on Wacky Wushu's dancing otter penguins to perform. The next day, Varric provided Bolin with a snowmobile with a two-person side compartment and a snowsuit equipped with a variety of emergency provisions and equipment, including a flotation device, internal heater, emergency beacon, and food ration pouch for his friend's journey with Avatar Korra to the Everstorm. Rebellion and Escape from the South After Unalak's battleships arrived at the Southern Water Tribe, a disgusted Varric joined several tribesmen in a meeting at Tonrock and Senna's house. Alarmed at the possibility of Unalak forcing his views on the South and potential shipping losses resulting from the Northern Blockade, Varric called for a rebellion against the chief. Unalak later suspected Varric of being involved in an attempt to remove him from power, calling for his arrest and trial. Varric managed to escape capture by hiding himself and Julie inside a stuffed platypus bear, Ping Ping, in his residence in the capital city. After Desna and Eska's search of the room turned up nothing, Varric revealed himself to Mako, Bolin, and Asami after overhearing Bolin's unsuccessful attempts to break up with Eska. He told his friend that he should instead run away. He refused to come out until he was absolutely sure it was safe. The billionaire had Julie give Bolin a bunch of yuans deposited from the statue's tail 
to bribe any guards to release their captive rebels, suspecting that Unalak rigged the trial. However, Bolin failed to understand the meaning of a bribe, giving the money to two complete strangers who failed to understand his subtle instruction. Sometime later, Avatar Korra came by, explaining that she had found out that Unalak had masterminded Tanrak's banishment and imprisonment, and resolved to free her father. At the same time, Bolin and Pabu entered the room, formally dressed, as Eska intended to forcibly marry him. Varric maintained his advice about running away before discussing how to free Tanrak and break the blockade. While Korra, Mako, and Asami went to free Tanrak, Bolin took Varric and Julie in their disguise to get to his ship. When questioned whether the platypus bear is licensed, Varric instructed Julie to cause a distraction by scattering money about. As bystanders started grabbing all the money they could find, the party was able to make it onto Varric's boat. However, Korra's group arrived to reveal that Tanrak and the other prisoners were being shipped to the north. With the next obstacle being the blockade, Varric brought out a biplane so Korra could get into the air and waterbend the northern ships out of the way. However, Asami noted that there was no runway for the plane to take off, but Korra and Mako were able to firebend to give the aircraft an extra boost as Asami piloted it. Korra was able to break the blockade, allowing them to catch up with the prison ship and free the prisoners, after dropping off Tanrak and the rebels so that they could start a resistance against Unalak. Korra agreed with her father's advice to get help from the United Forces. However, Varric spotted Eska advancing on their position, determined to get Bolin back. At the urging of his friend, Varric set full speed away from the enraged waterbender. Propaganda for the South Upon arriving at Republic City, Varric had Ju Li set up a meeting with President Raiko the next day. As everyone but Bolin had other preoccupations for the day, Varric decided to take his friend for a special night on the town, treating him to a VIP session at the Pro Bending Arena. The next day, Varric brought Korra to meet with Raiko and had to nudge the Avatar when she and the President had to pose for a photo. Unfortunately, the meeting did not go in their favor as Raiko refused to send the United Forces to aid the Civil War, preferring to resolve it diplomatically. Varric returned to his yacht where he attempted to show off for Bolin by firing arrows blindfolded, narrowly missing Asami as she and Korra arrived on the bridge. The two girls explained their respective dilemmas of striking a profit for future industries and getting military aid. Varric did some brainstorming by eating a hot pepper and hanging himself upside down. He told Asami that he could sell her mecha tanks to the south and Korra could go directly to General Iroh for aid. He also proposed using his moving pictures as propaganda against Unalak, with Bolin starring as Nuktuk, the hero character in the film. However, as they began filming, Korra came in asking for a boat to travel to the Fire Nation, revealing that Raiko had been tipped off by someone about their plan and subsequently barred Iroh from assisting them. Around this time, Varric began cooperating with the Agni Kai Triad to stage a bombing of the Southern Water Tribe Cultural Center and to intentionally sabotage some of his shipments. Varric did this with the intent of placing more blame during the war onto the North's shoulders. Shortly afterward, the first of Varric's propaganda films was published, and Julie informed Varric that one of his shipments had been stolen, a shipment that he had done in a partnership with Future Industries. Varric went to police headquarters where he found Asami and expressed his sorrow over the stolen equipment. He listened in on the interrogation of the ship's captain and Mako's claim that the crime had a connection to the bombing of the Southern Water Tribe Cultural Center. When Mako was ordered to silence, Varric and Asami entered the interrogation room as well, coming to the firebender's aid. However, they were soon all ordered out by Lin Bei Fong. Outside, Varric overheard Mako and Asami's plans for a sting operation and promptly offered one of his ships, although he gave off the impression that he did not know what it was for. However, after Asami and Mako had turned to the Triple Threat Triad for help, Varric hired them as well via a middleman to keep them busy, which would enable him to rob a future industries warehouse. To provide himself with an alibi, he occupied himself with shooting another episode for the adventures of Nuktuk, Hero of the South Mover. After a successful execution of his plan, Varric met up with Asami at Future Industries, where he officially bought a controlling share in the company. Right after signing, Mako came in, announcing that he had figured out who was behind the thefts, though when he noticed Varric, he decided not to share his findings. However, the firebender's initial outburst had been enough to alert Varric that Mako was investigating him. A week later, Varric ordered two men to bring Mako before him in order for them to talk. In his usual light-hearted manner, he attempted to get Mako off his back by offering him a job on his security team, but was refused, even after implying that something might befall Asami or Bolin if Mako kept refusing. 
Realizing that Mako would not yield to his influence and would risk implicating him, Varric planted yuans and explosives in Mako's apartment and had the triple threat triad claim to the police that Mako assisted them with robbing future industries. Kidnapping attempt, arrest, and escape. Later at night, Varric premiered the final installment of his mover series, inviting the president and his wife in an attempt to kidnap him and blame it on the Northern Water Tribe. However, Varric's complicity was outed for a packed pro-bending arena to hear when Bolin foiled the attempt and forced a confession out of one of the kidnappers. The businessman attempted to leave, but was thwarted and swiftly arrested by Chief Beifong and her officers. Because his company had built the prison, Varric had commissioned a luxurious cell to be included in the design, as he predicted he would end up there one day. As such, he was imprisoned surrounded by wealth, as well as with Julie, who never left his side and continued to serve him. He was approached by Team Avatar, who was seeking transportation to the south. Although they were initially hostile toward him, he pointed out that although he had done some bad things, he had also done commendable things, like warning Korra about Unalak, making Bolin famous, and saving Asami's company. When asked by Bolin what he had done with the stolen Future Industries machinery, he revealed that it had been stashed away on his battleship, the Zhu Li. To make up for the mess he had caused for everyone, he offered his battleship and everything on it as a peace offering. When the Dark Avatar was laying waste to the city, the wall of Varric's cell was destroyed by one of the huge vines. Seeing his chance to escape, Varric ordered Julie to commence Operation Winged Freedom, which meant that she was to strap a backpack containing wings to her back and hold on to him, enabling them both to soar out of the prison to freedom during the chaos. Having witnessed the energy Unavatu wielded, Varric got the idea of harnessing spirit power. Making their way out of the city and into the woods, Julie served as Varric's mode of transportation, carrying him around on her back. Life in Zaofu Varric took refuge in Zaofu, where his friend, Suyin Beifong, granted him a position as head of her technology department. A few weeks after Harmonic Convergence, Zaofu was visited by Team Avatar and Lin, who sought Suyin's airbending daughter, Opal. As Varric joined his current and former associates for dinner, Bolin was the first to acknowledge him. Asami wanted to know what Varric was doing there, but he mostly dodged the question, wondrously asking what anyone was doing there. He subsequently asked Asami about how their company was doing, only for Asami to remind him that she regained full ownership because of Varric's conspiracy to kidnap Raiko. The industrialist pointed out that technically he was never convicted, to which Mako pointed out that it was because he escaped, but the businessman realized that the universe saw fit to liberate him. He explained to Mako that he looked up Su Yin, pitched her some ideas, and entered into business with her as the head of the city's technology division. He quickly began pitching his plans for a high-speed train to revolutionize transportation and shipping, but was interrupted by Lin, who was angry that her half-sister would give refuge to a fugitive. Su Yin defended that she believed Varric was deserving of a chance at redemption, prompting Lin to storm out. The next morning, Varric was testing a new suit composed of magnetic materials. The drill was a success as he caught the families and Team Avatar's dishes before having Julie unplug it and clean up the resulting mess. At Opal's farewell dinner, Varric tried to offer a saddened Bolin relationship advice, but the Earthbender declined, prompting Varric to comment that it was his loss. He subsequently had Ju Li bring him his new device, an Airbender Finder, which he showed to Asami and Korra. When Asami could not get it to register as she pointed it at Korra, believing it was broken, the industrialist told them it needed to be airbent into for it to work. He raised his glass in a toast to Opal a short time later. After the estate was penetrated by the Red Lotus, who attempted to kidnap Korra, Varric was among those questioned by Ai Wei, as it was concluded only someone with inside information could have helped the criminals into the estate. He explained he was doing his nightly routine, checking his body for ticks, performing his very calisthenics, and 30 minutes of holding his breath. He also had the routine filmed and asked if they wanted to see, but an annoyed and grossed out Ai Wei told him it was not necessary. Varric and Julie subsequently left. Later, Varric was scouring the scene of the previous night's battle for pumice stones when he overheard Team Avatar talking about the betrayal of Zaofu and the guard suspected to be the culprit. While having Julie rub the stones on his feet to prevent calluses, Varric explained that he could recognize a conspiracy when he encountered one, saying he too would say someone was guilty and plant evidence as proof, referencing how he framed Mako for the theft of Future Industries equipment. The industrialist's suggestion led the team to who was truly the traitor the only man who could keep a secret, namely Ai Wei. A few weeks after the assassination of Earth Queen Ho Ting, 
Varric left Zaofu upon Kuvira's request to help her stabilize Ba Sing Se and the rest of the Earth Kingdom. Bearing the rank of corporal in her army, he was in charge of inventions that would benefit the force. In this capacity, he modernized Hiroshi Sato's model of the mecha tanks, which became a prominent part of Kuvira's army. Life as Kuvira's Officer En route to the State of Yi, Varric ordered Zhu Li to provide everyone with a cup of celebratory tea after Bolin reported that two more states had joined Kuvira's cause, which brought their goal 10% away from completion. However, they all digressed to consume the beverage when Kuvira announced that she would not celebrate until the entire kingdom was united, which caused them all to spill their drink on their clothes when the train came to a sudden halt due to a roadblock. Kuvira's train made it to Republic City a day before Prince Wu's coronation, giving Varric and the other officers the time to check into the Republic City Four Elements. While waiting in the lobby for Zhu Li to catch up to him with all his luggage, Varric amusedly mused that President Raiko must have turned purple when Kuvira forced him to pardon the industrialist of his crimes. When Zhu Li called him an upstanding citizen, Varric readily agreed with her, before whispering to his assistant that she needed to fill his extra bag with as many little lavender-scented soaps as she could find. The next day, Varric sat between Bolin and Zhu Li on the bleachers facing the podium on which Wu was crowned the 54th Earth Monarch with the royal brooch. When Kuvira denounced Wu's authority and usurped power over the Earth Kingdom, which she renamed the Earth Empire, for herself, Varric stood up and loudly applauded and cheered for the army leader. After the ceremony, Varric retired with the other officers to the presidential suite in the Four Elements, where he was enjoying a cold beverage while talking to a nervous Bolin. Upon being asked if Kuvira's declaration would not turn all the world leaders against them, Varric brushed off the lava bender's worries, stating that there was nothing the other nations could do since the nation was under Kuvira's control and Republic City was desperate for the metal they were mining. The conversation was cut short when Julie entered the room, presenting a spirit vine to the industrialist. Varric inspected the vegetation and, approving it, ordered for it to be taken back to their lab and stabilized immediately. By the time the army train was back en route, Varric had cut off a piece of the spirit vine and put it in a container, hooked and wired it to a machine in order to experiment. He was ordered by Kuvira to make the development of the technology, which he claimed would change everything, his top priority. Deserting the Army While traveling to Zaofu, Varric continued his spirit vine experiments. In order to document their progress, he had Julie set up a camera. Upon being notified that they were rolling, he introduced himself in the experiment. Being handed a stasis capsule that contained a sample of a spirit vine, he staggered toward a machine to put the tube in place. As his assistant secured the cables, Varric continued narrating his experiment and switched the lever of the machine, turning it on. He explained that he had postulated the vines are a form of pure energy that had become unstable in the physical world. It was his hope that the machine would transfer the energy from the vine into a battery using electrical currents, reverse magnetic polarity, and a phenomenon he liked to call the very effect. Checking up on the machine's progress, he excitedly noted that it was working, as it had already gathered five varics of power. As the machine reached seven varics, it overloaded, however, urging the panicked inventor to order Julie to shut it down. When the machine was unresponsive, the excess energy shot out in a concentrated energy beam, ripping a hole in the back of the wagon. The rattling of the train knocked Varric off balance, and he tumbled back against the wall. Noticing Julie was barely holding onto the back of the cart, dangling above the tracks, he tried to pull her up. Upon failing a first time, he noted that she was too heavy and could stand to lose some weight. Being told that he was merely weak and needed to pull harder, Varric increased his efforts and managed to drag Julie back into the cart, where she landed on top of him. When Julie was impressed that he had saved her, Varric gently placed his hands on her cheeks and declared that it was only natural for him to have done so. He unknowingly broke Julie's romantic mood, however, when he added that it was because he would not clean up the mess of the explosion by himself. He pushed his assistant off of him and ordered her to grab a broom. The commotion had drawn the attention of Kuvira and Batar Jr., who entered his wagon, asking if they had come under attack. Standing up and dusting himself off, Varric reassured the military commander that they had merely been spirit-vined, though she did not need to worry as he was terminating the project. While shutting down the power to the various stasis capsules that held more spirit-vine samples, he was ordered to continue the experiment, because wielding such power would be beneficial for the army. Wary about such power falling into the wrong hands, Varric was convinced that stopping the experiment was necessary. As Batar Jr. inquired why he was concerned with that, Varric admitted that it was not like him, considering he was usually only concerned with himself making money, regardless of any ethical consequences. 
He revealed that it had been a recent development for him to be concerned with others and to hear a nagging voice in his head which told him what was right from wrong, which Julie clarified to be his conscience. Although Kuvira told him to continue in his project, Varric remained adamant about terminating it. Not taking the opposition well, Kuvira metal bent Varric's shoulder plates around his neck and dangled him outside the train above the track. Fearing for his life, he quickly reconsidered and declared that he would continue working on the project. He was roughly hauled back into the vehicle, being slammed on the metal floor, and when Kuvira stepped over him on her way out, he glared at his two retreating superiors. Varric was subsequently locked inside his cart, much to his displeasure. He started to panic and ordered Julie to hold her breath as he believed he was running out of air. As she calmly refused, he angrily turned on her, proclaiming that they were both going to die. When Bolin opened a hatch in the ceiling and called out to the inventor, Varric was initially confused, believing his head voices to be back. After Julie wordlessly directed his attention to the hatch, he wondered since when that opening had been there. However, he instantly dismissed his own question and urged the earthbender to descend into the wagon as he had important information to relay. When the two men stood face to face, they grabbed each other by the collar and declared simultaneously that Kuvira was crazy, revealing to one another that they had been threatened by her. Agreeing that they needed to get away from there, Varric signaled Julie, who immediately exited the train via the hatch and lowered her hands to pull her employer up. The three each secured a mecha suit and made their escape to the nearby forest. As Bolin proposed a way to sneak into Zaufu, Varric loudly announced that they were not heading toward the city, deeming it to be doomed and were on their way to Republic City instead. Since Bolin wanted to stay to help, Varric noted that they were helping by warning the world about Kuvira's potential superweapon. Before they could make up their minds, however, they were ambushed by Batar Jr. and two sergeants of the army, each piloting a mecha suit as well. As Batar Jr. launched himself at Varric after having shot down Bolin, the inventor ducked inside his suit for cover, leaving Julie to defend him. As one of the sergeants charged for Varric, he staggered back and tried to retaliate with his flamethrower, though accidentally opened his visor instead, opening and closing it rapidly. Being saved by Julie, he asked her what idiot had designed the suits, though upon learning that it had been him, he ordered her to lecture less and focus more on saving his life as another opponent was incoming. With the assailants occupied, Varric made a break for it and sought refuge up a tree. Wanting to help, he managed to charge his electricity attack, though accidentally knocked down Julie with it. He eventually got caught in the bola of one of the sergeants and was forced to abandon his suit and flee on foot. Scrambling up a hill, he was once again saved by his assistant who hurled a boulder at his pursuer to keep him at bay. However, Varric could not escape Batar Jr., who threatened to kill him in order to force Julie and Bolin to surrender. Being held over a cliff by the head, the captured inventor sarcastically thanked his assistant for his predicament. Escorted back to camp, Varric and the others were presented to Kuvira, who ordered them to be sent away on the next train, with specific orders for Varric to continue working on the Spirit Energy Project under close armed supervision. He was shocked when Julie subsequently denounced her loyalty to him and called him a fool compared to the army commander. As she pledged her allegiance to Kuvira, Varric urged her to reconsider based on their history together, though he was blamed by an angry Julie to have never appreciated her, despite the fact that she did everything he ever asked of her. As she ordered the guards to do the thing, Varric was dragged out of Kuvira's tent by two soldiers, screaming and begging his assistant to not order the thing. Varric and Bolin were placed on a train that took them away from Zaufu. Spending the night on the floor of his prison cell, he mumbled in his sleep before starting awake, screaming Julie's name. As he took in his surroundings, however, he dejectedly noted that his assistant truly was gone. He was approached by Batar Jr. and two metal-bending soldiers, who ordered him to go to work in the new lab they had set up for him. He reminisced about always being greeted in the morning by Julie with a hot cup of tea, though was told that he would receive the beverage when he started working. Varric pointed out that he was only productive for 15 minutes a day, usually in the afternoon from 3.45 until 4 p.m., a comment that caused him to be roughly slammed against the wall. The eccentric inventor complained that he could not work without an assistant, as he declared himself to be helpless without Julie, upon which he was assigned one of the soldiers. However, he spooked the guard by revealing how the experiment created an uncontrollable blast of energy last time they tried it, pointing out that the man might lose his hands. As such, Bolin was assigned to help Varric instead. As Varric started tinkering at the machine containing the stasis capsule with a spirit vine sample in it, he held out his hand to Bolin and told him to do the thing. When the lava bender was confused as to what he should be doing, an irritated Varric turned toward him, restating to do the thing, 
and adding that he never needed to elaborate on his requests with Zhu Li. He stood up and retrieved the tweezers that he had requested himself, demonstrating them to Bo Lin as he returned to his station. When he continued his work, Batar Jr. ordered him to walk through every step of the project. Varric pushed the second-in-command back and started telling him that he had envisioned using the Spirit Vine energy as a source of clean, unlimited energy, rather than a weapon of mass destruction. He was chastised by Batar Jr. for wanting to limit his invention to clean energy, as Batar Jr. believed it was their responsibility as scientists to push the boundaries of the possible once a discovery was made. Varric jabbed at him, however, that he would not know anything about scientific discoveries, as he could not even discover a wolf bat if it was building a nest in his butt. When Batar Jr. called the inventor pathetic and corrected him on the fact that wolf bats did not build nests, Varric sarcastically commented that he was bested due to that remark. He stood up and pointed out that Batar Jr. would never know how it felt to give birth to genius only to have it kidnapped and raised by fools. When Batar Jr. threatened to order the guards to roughly force him to continue his work, Varric returned to his station, though as he passed Bolin, he revealed that they had failed to control the power last time when they ran the current through the vine, and that he was trying something new this time in an attempt to direct it. When he continued adjusting the power source on his invention, Varric requested Bolin to hand him the screwdriver. When the Earthbender lamented about helping Kuvira's army by building the weapon, Varric retold the story of how he got the idea for spirit energy during Unavatu's attack, and added in a meaningful manner that he knew what he was doing. When the machine refused to start, the eccentric inventor tapped and kicked the contraption. When it finally sprung to life, bathing in a purple light, Varric candidly pointed out that the source of the incisive ticking filling the wagon was a timer. Asked for more details, he irritatingly added that it was for the bomb that was set to detonate five minutes later and destroy all his research and everyone in its vicinity. Varric smugly turned to Batar Jr. and urged him to leave their part of the train, adding that he and Bolin were ready to die in the explosion. Stated to be bluffing, he dared Kuvira's second-in-command to call him on it, and finished his rant by calling out to Zhu Li, declaring that she would be sorry to have left him as her name would become synonymous with betrayal. As Batar Jr. gave the order for the guards to arrest him, Varric revealed himself to be in the possession of a remote control with which he could instantly detonate the bomb if the guards came any closer. Forcing everyone to leave their half of the train, Varric commented that they were nearly out of time. When Batar Jr. stated him to be insane, he quickly answered that they had known that from the moment they hired him. He proceeded to tell Bolin to do the thing, though irritatingly had to elaborate that he was referring to unhooking the carts. When they were alone in their cart, Bolin complimented his plan, revealing that he had succeeded in convincing him as well with the intention to blow them up. Upon being asked how they could shut the bomb down, Varric revealed that he had not been bluffing about the explosion, much to the younger man's distress. Varric poetically said his goodbye to Julie, though was slapped in the face by Bolin and told that he was hated. Grabbed by the shoulder, Varric was pulled along to jump through a hatch that exited right above the tracks. After Bolin tunneled away for them through the earth and exited at the bottom of the crater created by the explosion, Varric tumbled out, coughing and desperate for air. He soon started to laugh, however, and complimented Bolin on having done the thing, bestowing him with a kiss on the forehead. Bolin glared at the inventor and told him that he could not believe that Julie had worked for him as long as she had. Escaping the Earth Empire Varric and Bolin started their journey toward Republic City on foot, though Varric soon used the Earthbender as his mount. When a tired Bolin proposed that the inventor would walk on his own for a while, Varric promptly compared him to Zhu Li and bragged that the latter could carry him for 20 miles a day with a sprained ankle. He was unceremoniously dropped on the ground and irritatingly told that Zhu Li was not there. Momentarily taken aback, Varric waved off Bolin's action as something he deserved, telling the younger man to leave him in the forest to be gobbled up by worms. Upon being reminded that he was the one responsible for Kuvira trying to make a super weapon, he declared himself to be a horrible person. He was motivated to go on, however, when Bolin noted that they would atone for their actions by making it back to Republic City and warn the world about Kuvira's plans. Varric complimented Bolin on his motivational skills and proposed to carry him on his back for a while, an offer that was gladly accepted. They did not get very far, however, as a struggling Varric immediately stepped into a trap which suspended them in a net high above the ground. When Bolin was unable to break the ropes and expressed his wish to have Pabu there with them, as the fire ferret could have just gnawed them out of their predicament, Varric absentmindedly noted that Julie too had incisors sharp as a knife. 
When they were approached by a group of people and Bolin asked if they would free them, Varric took offense when Anna described them as lowly Earth Empire soldiers, bragging that they had been part of Kuvira's inner circle. After they were cut down and tied up, he grew surprised over learning that Kuvira had been purging the Earth Empire of everyone not of Earth Kingdom origin. Varric irritatingly asked them where they were taking them, being told that the escapees planned to use them to talk their way past a border checkpoint. After Bolin used his earth and lava bending to push them all back, Varric triumphantly noted that they had not been expecting lava time. As Bolin emphasized once more that they no longer work for Kuvira, Varric added that they would be goners if they were recognized trying to pass the checkpoint. Varric and Bolin did team up with the fugitives, however, when it became apparent that the only way either party was getting out of the Earth Empire was by trusting each other and working together. Varric and Bolin walked in front of the now tied up fugitives, and upon reaching the checkpoint, he was told by Bolin to follow his lead and saluted the guard post officer. When Bolin was at a loss for what to do when he could not convince the guard to let them pass, as he was adamant about seeing a transfer order, Varric grew annoyed and surged forward, ranting to the officer about the hardships he had allegedly suffered through to get there. He relayed that he had to fight off two badger moles, six wolf bats, and eighteen hog monkeys, one of which had eaten their transfer orders. He continued to state that he was in sore need of a shower and suffered from large blisters. He gave the officer the choice to either let them through or give him his name and rank to Kuvira, as not letting them pass was allegedly against her orders. When the officer relented and granted them passage, Varric smiled at another guard post soldier, though was recognized when they reached the other side of the wall of the checkpoint. In the ensuing battle, Varric retreated to cover near the wall, where he witnessed the difficulties his allies were having with the defending guards and mecha suits. Noticing a generator inside the office, he promptly started building a makeshift electromagnetic pulse device using a metal table leg, a cable, and the generator. Firing his weapon, he managed to shut down the four mecha suits and prompted Bolin to flee with him. Varric was stopped, however, when the Earthbender turned to save all the fugitives from the still defending soldiers. After Bolin had created a mode of lava to prevent the guards from following them, they all moved away from the checkpoint. As they reached the shore where the escapees boarded a small boat, Baraz and Anna offered to give them a lift on their boat as they were heading north as well, though Varric instantly declined it, deeming the vessel to be a hunk of junk and noting that he was allergic to drowning. After Bolin elbowed him though, he accepted the offer and climbed aboard with great difficulty. Retelling Bolin's Story The fugitives told stories in order to entertain each other on the long seaward journey, though after Baraz recalled the origin of his dislike of onion bark soup, and aboard Bolin asked everyone if there was someone else who wanted to throw themselves overboard as well, Varric joyfully noted that he had spent the last few hours luring out all of the incredibly boring stories while mentally composing the most exciting tale ever told, which he planned to convert into the greatest mover ever made. He presented Bolin as Nuktuk in Bolin, Hero of the World, intending to capitalize on the audience of the Nuktuk franchise. When Bolin lamented that he did not deserve to be called a hero, as he had betrayed his friends and family, Varric waved off his complaints as merely emphasizing the wrong story beats, and started his story when he first met Bolin at the Southern Water Tribe. Varric depicted himself as a handsome, wise sage and richest merchant in the world, who intended to teach a worthy pupil the power of levitation, which turned out to be Bolin. When he made Nuktuk sing, however, he was interrupted by the real Bolin, who adamantly stated that he had not been singing, Varric had not been levitating, and Asami was just a friend, not his girlfriend. After Bolin failed to enthuse the fugitives with the true version of how he met Korra, Varric dismissed him as being on-screen talent who should leave the storytelling to the masters. Varric continued his story, hypothesizing that Avatar Korra became trapped in the spirit world, which made it the perfect time for the world's most evil villains to team up and take out Bolin, stating that Zaheer had led a group consisting of himself, Vatu, Aman, and Unalak. Varric was once again interrupted by Bolin, who inquired how their collaboration would have even occurred, to which the inventor answered that the villains had held a conference call. Varric went over Bolin's love interests, though had to urge his friend to stop crying upon his mention of Opal. He continued his story in which Bolin had to assemble an airbending army, whom he taught to create a tornado that turns Zaheer into wind. As harmonic convergence started, Varric stated that Bolin had turned into a giant spirit upon being hit with amplified energy beams from the connected portals, enabling him to fight on par with Unavatu. When Unavatu was on the verge of corrupting Bolin's spirit, his strong spiritual mojo had attracted the queen of the fairies, 
who aided him to turn his enemy into magic dust with which he created the stars in the sky. As Varric quickly ended the story, making Bolin turn into a dragon, go into the spirit world, and save the Avatar, he received a standing ovation from the fugitives, much to Bolin's shock. He grew slightly annoyed when Bolin started to point out the plot holes in the script, such as the discarded storyline of Zombie Amon, though happily told his friend to never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Defending Republic City Varric and Bolin made their way back to Republic City and set course for City Hall, where they interrupted a meeting between the world leaders, except the Water Tribe representatives, though they were immediately apprehended as traitors on Raiko's orders. Before they could be taken away, Bolin mentioned that they had top-secret information, and they were released, prompting Varric to note that they should have opened with that. After Bolin failed to plainly reveal Kuvira's plans, Varric stated that the Master Metalbender was building a superweapon. He was surprised to learn that Korra knew it had something to do with spirit vines, and he concluded that they would all be doomed if Kuvira managed to figure out how to harness the power of the vines taken from the foggy swamp. As one of the two most brilliant minds in Republic City, Varric was later called to City Hall by President Raiko to work together with Asami to find a defense against Kuvira's spirit vine charged superweapon. As Varric noted how nice it was to be welcomed back with open arms, he was quickly corrected by the President that he was there out of necessity as opposed to a voluntary choice. In turn, Varric corrected the President when he brought up his kidnapping attempt of him to say that he only allegedly tried to do that. He cowered back, however, when Asami snapped at him for doing everything allegedly, though when she brought up the bombing of the Southern Water Tribe Cultural Center, he defended himself by noting that he was the owner of that building and thus had the right to blow up his own property. On Raiko's urging, the two stopped bickering, and Varric readily offered his hand to Asami to shake on a new partnership, though as she took it, she placed his hand in a lock to emphasize her threat that he better not double-cross her again, causing him to squirm in pain and quickly nod in agreement. Varric and Asami came up with the idea of manufacturing a mecha suit that could fly in every direction. When they reported back to the President, he cheated Asami out of revealing the idea, though still gave her the credit for having come up with it after witnessing dragonfly hummingbirds. When Raiko asked where the spirit ray was positioned, Varric sternly told the President that they would not include such a weapon, as he deemed the spirit vine technology to be too dangerous to be used by anyone. Later, while overseeing the manufacturing of the hummingbird mecha suits, inspiring his workers to increase their productivity since they only had two weeks to finish the project, Varric was interrupted by Bolin, who wished to talk to him. He was shocked when Bolin revealed that he had brought back Julie from his rescue mission at Zaofu. Julie urged him to listen to her first before he said anything. After she apologized for all the things she had said to him in front of Kuvira and revealed that he meant the world to her, Varric told her she did not need to be so hard on herself. Although he gently reached for her as he was going to cup her cheek, he grabbed hold of her shoulder at the last moment and exuberantly exclaimed that he accepted her apology, before ordering her to man the assembly line like a good assistant. Much to his shock, Julie refused to be his assistant any longer and demanded to be treated like an equal. As she stormed out, a clueless Varric turned to Bolin and shrugged, much to the latter's annoyance. A week later, Varric received the help of Asami, Bolin, Mako, Suyin, Wei, and Wing to get at least a few hummingbird suits to working condition, since Kuvira's arrival was a week ahead of schedule. After she arrived hours later and sunk the United Forces battleships in a matter of seconds with the Spirit Energy Cannon, Varric exclaimed that such destruction was exactly the reason why he had refused to build the weapon. When Korra later joined them at the factory, alerting them all that Raiko had surrendered, leaving the fate of the city in their hands, he stated that Batar Jr. was a better inventor than he originally thought for having been able to manufacture such a large mecha suit, though noted that no one was allowed to tell Batar Jr. that. The comment gave Korra the idea to kidnap Batar Jr. with the help of a stealth team of airbenders. As she brought Kuvira's second-in-command to the factory as well, Varric stood by while she and Suyin tried to convince him to reveal how they could defeat the enormous mecha suit carrying the spirit energy weapon. After Batar Jr. contacted Kuvira and seemingly succeeded to convince her to cease her conquest of the United Republic, Varric was forced to run for his life when Kuvira traced Batar Jr.'s radio call toward the factory and blew it up with her spirit energy cannon. Varric managed to survive the explosion and emerged from the rubble with everyone else when Bolin lifted an enormous piece of concrete. When Korra and Lin announced that they refused to give up Republic City to Kuvira and would take on her spirit energy cannon, Varric noted that the benders were on their own, since the blast had destroyed all of the hummingbird mecha suits at their factory. After Asami reasoned that they could adapt the remaining prototypes to get them airborne, 
he left with her and all the wounded toward her office at Future Industries Tower, while the Benders faced Kuvira and her army in an attempt to stop them, or at the very least, slow them down. Despite their best efforts, Varric, Julie, and Asami had trouble getting the hummingbird suits to work. Believing he had fixed the hydraulics, he told Asami and Julie to test out one of the suits. When Asami soon discovered that she was unable to stabilize the machine, blaming him for failing to fix it, he dismissed her complaint and ordered her to twist harder, though the suit spun out of control and crashed. After Daw warned them all that a platoon of mecha suits was incoming, Varric announced that he knew how to take them down and promptly ordered Asami to disconnect all the electrical devices before running out of her office with Julie. The duo made their way to the roof of the tall tower, and after equipping Julie with a spool of metal cables, started to climb the lightning rod. Varric reasoned that since he could stop the regular size mecha suits with a normal electromagnetic pulse, an enormous pulse could stop an enormous suit. As he was adjusting the wiring to put his plan into motion, he revealed to Julie that he had been thinking a lot about her, admitting that there were several things he should tell her since there was a chance they would not survive the battle with Kuvira. He started to recall his early life in ostrich horse, though before he could reach the point of his story, Julie notified him that Kuvira's troops were within range. As she flipped the switch to the electromagnetic pulse, Varric excitedly saw that the regular mecha suits all shut down, though was shocked to find the enormous suit unaffected. Panicked, he called for Julie to do the thing, though she sadly answered that she feared there were no more things to do. Returning inside, Varric was asked by Bolin why his electromagnetic pulse attack had left Kuvira's enormous suit unaffected, though before he could answer, Batar Jr. explained that it was because the suit was powered by spirit vine energy. When Hiroshi joined their group and postulated the idea to add plasma saws to the hummingbird mecha suits so they were able to land on Kuvira's machine and cut through its armor like a metal mosquito, Varric alerted them to all the dangers of being crushed, prompting Korra to declare that the benders would distract Kuvira to keep that from happening. As such, following Hiroshi's lead, he, Asami, and Julie added an electrical element to the welding torches already on their suits and converted them into plasma saws. When the suits were ready and Julie was about to board, Varric walked up to her and, swallowing nervously, declared that he needed to attach something before they took off. As Julie was puzzled about the meaning of his words, he promptly opened the small box he was holding, revealing the green ring it held inside, and dropped to his knee, asking her if she would do the thing for the rest of their lives. When she accepted his proposal, he slipped the ring on her finger and kissed her, before taking her in his arms and excitedly announced that they would go attack Kuvira's high-tech machine with their barely functional prototype suits. The two subsequently boarded the same mecha suit, with Julie being the pilot and Varric manning the welding torch. Approaching Kuvira's machine, Varric told Julie to land on the spot in the middle of the enormous suit's back, guiding her by making a comparison to a specific spot on his own back that he could never reach. The moment they touched down, Varric started welding, though before he could inflict any serious damage, they were forced to abort their attempt lest they would be crushed. Hovering at a safe distance, Varric noted that he wished he had the kind of flexibility the suit had as to be able to reach that spot. They tried to land again, though Kuvira kept lashing out at them, preventing them from attempting another attack. Eventually, Varric and Julie's suit had a wing blown off when Kuvira fired her spirit energy cannon. Before they crashed against a building, Julie flipped the ejection seat switches, and she and Varric floated off to safety with their parachutes. Having made a safe landing, Varric and Julie eventually made their way to the heart of the spirit wilds, where now a new spirit portal was located. Realizing Korra and Kuvira were nowhere to be found, Varric and the rest of Team Avatar set out to search the area, scouring his surroundings from atop the wreckage of the enormous mecha suit. After all the spirits returned a moment later, he was glad to see that Korra emerged from the portal as well. After Kuvira was handcuffed and escorted away, Varric joined in with the group hug the team bestowed on Korra. Wedding Following Kuvira's defeat, Varric and Julie received permission from Tenzin to hold their wedding ceremony and party at Air Temple Island, decorating parts of the island in a winter theme. While Bolin acted as the official during their ceremony, Varric snapped at one of his cameramen to focus on him because it was his big day, as opposed to randomly filming the audience, and gave Bolin a skeptical look when the Earthbender described his bond with Julie as the longest of long shots. His demeanor swiftly changed, however, when Bolin asked him if he, Sir Iknik Blackstone Varric of the Southern Water Tribe, Master of the High Seas, would take the Lady Julie Moon as his lawfully wedded wife and treat her as his honored and cherished partner, to which he excitedly answered positively. In his own vows, Varric had described a list of tasks that Julie would have to perform, 
scrubbing his calluses on a bi-weekly basis being one of them, which Bolin refused to read, when Julie accepted nonetheless, and Bolin announced that they could do the thing, Varric was dipped by his wife so she could kiss him. As the couple turned to the now applauding audience, Varric started to cry out of happiness. Wiping his tears, he took a remote out of his pocket, and together with Julie, he flipped the switch, setting off a firework display. During the dinner party, Varric led his wife in a dance, though afterward he went to search for Tenzin, intending to borrow one of the airbender wingsuits to fly off the temple's tower. Evacuee Crisis In the aftermath of Kuvira's invasion of the United Republic of Nations, Varric joined his wife and the other volunteers at the temporary evacuee camp. One evening, he was helping Julie, Kaya, and Tenzin distribute the last of the food rations to the hungry evacuees. When they ran out of supplies and the gathered crowd started to protest, Varric asked in a panic what they should do now, as the evacuees had already devoured his entire supply of Varric cakes. Despite the shortage, he produced one last cake he had saved for himself and immediately devoured the pastry, defending himself against the disapproving looks from Julie, Tenzin, and Kaya that he could not work on an empty stomach. When Julie was stressing about the situation and the fact that President Raiko was actively working against her, Varric led her away from the crowd and inside a nearby tent, noting that he could not stand to see her so bent out of shape, and suggested that she massage her troubles away. Inside, he positioned himself on a chair and told Julie not to hold back with the pressure, as he was exceptionally tight in the shoulders. When she glared at him, noting that she had been under the impression that she was the one to be massaged, a nervous Varric immediately switched places with her vowing to be the best shoulder kneader ever for her. During the massage, Julie asked Varric for his opinion on the possibility that she should run for president against Raiko. He was immediately enthusiastic about the idea, ensuring her that she would win as she was the most tenacious, brilliant, inspiring woman he knew, and that the people loved her. When Julie, comforted by his words, agreed with him and announced that she would run for president, an enthusiastic Varric swept her off her feet, declaring that her decision called for a celebration. Varric donned his director's uniform as he led his camera crew to the fortified area around the spirit portal. He reminded the rest of his camera crew that there were no second takes in a docu-mover, and made sure to frame the shot so the spirit portal was behind Julie, taking care to amplify her publicity. As Julie and Varric continued filming and supporting the protests, Tokuga flew overhead in an airship, demanding that the United Republic withdraw his troops or face poison gas attached to his airship. And if any attempts to attack the ship were made, he had Asami Sato and Wang Yang Kim on board, and they would be killed. Julie declared that they needed to start evacuating the people, and began leading the protesters and her filming crew away from the portal. Varric advised the camera crew to make sure Julie looked heroic as they filmed her. When it seemed like Julie had everyone, she noticed a young girl named Sachi had been left behind due to an injured leg and ran back into the poison gas to attempt to save her. Julie grabbed her and carried her into the safety of her mom. A member of the film crew confirmed he had captured the moment on camera, and a different film crew member captured footage of Raiko running away from the civilians in danger. Varric excitedly proclaimed that they had a good docu-mover. In the following three weeks, Varric published his docu-mover, and many voters praised Julie's altruism and condemned Raiko's decision to retreat during the crisis at the spirit portal. On election night, Varric awaited the results of the election in a plaza with Julie and her supporters, where his docu-movers played, and Shiro Shinobi discussed the events of the election as he prepared to announce the results. As the results came in, Shiro announced that Julie had won in a landslide victory of 68%. Upon hearing the results, Julie stood backstage as crowd members chanted her name, and Varric congratulated her before sending her on stage to do the thing. Serving as First Gentleman After Julie took office as president, Varric approached Bolin, now Julie's personal assistant, and asked about the earliest date he could have a dinner date with his wife. Bolin told him that there were no availables until the end of the month, and Varric grew frustrated, asking who knew being president would be so much work. Bolin responded that he was sure Julie knew. Varric was present when Wu gave his speech announcing the impending democratic elections to take place in the state of Gaoling, and nervously plugged his ears as Wu awkwardly answered the press's question through the medium of song. He later attended the beginning of Kuvira's trial. After Kuvira's return from Gaoling, Varric was summoned to be a witness to her tribunal. The judges asked him to confirm that he initially helped develop spirit technology for the Earth Empire, which he accepted, but added that he had tried to shut the project down once he realized how dangerous it was. He was asked if Kuvira agreed with his decision, and he told the court that she did not, forcing him to keep working on it and threatening to kill him if he did not do as she said. 
adding that she was a horrible person. Kuvira told him that his testimony was enough, and he cowered, pleading with her not to hurt him. The judges ordered Kuvira not to intimidate the witness and that they would proceed to hear the testimony, though Kuvira told them it would not be necessary as she had decided to confess to her charges and enter a guilty plea. Did you enjoy the video? Be sure to tell us in the comments. And make sure to subscribe. And check out these other great videos from the Amagi. If you'd like to support me, you can also subscribe to my personal channel. See you guys tomorrow!